was asked to give the keynote, I suppose, uh, because I come from a long way away and do not, in fact, know a lot about impaired driving. Um, so I've, I've chosen as my keynote uh, this morning um, A below middle C, so let's try it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. I, I, Ross, I hope it was worth flying me 18 hours to give that keynote, but now that I've got a little bit of time left, let me say a couple of words about impaired driving. Um, I really want to make two central points. Um, one is that driving impaired by other drugs is not very much like driving impaired by alcohol. We've had a long and relatively successful campaign against drunk driving. We now have lots of other psychoactives, recreational psychoactives coming up in popularity. And it's perfectly natural to turn to the alcohol example and say, well, all right, we've, we've got our formula. Pass a per se law, create your testing standards, go out and do the testing, punish people for driving impaired, then they'll stop. I want to suggest that alcohol is fundamentally different on several dimensions and that copying over our alcohol laws and filling in the names of various other recreational drugs is a terrible idea. And I want to, I want to warn the group against Sir Humphrey's syllogism. How many, how many yes minister fans are, are there in the room? Okay, yes. Well, you'll, you'll remember that at one point, uh, Sir Humphrey proposes to his minister some completely foolish response to a situation. And the minister points out that it's a completely foolish response. And then Sir Humphrey comes out with a syllogism, which goes, we must do something. This is something. Therefore, we must do this. Um, that, it seems to me, is the only justification you could come up with for a per se cannabis impairment law given our current state of knowledge. And I should point out that laws are much easier to pass than they are to repeal. We're likely to get locked into foolish policies. And no state legislator in the U.S. is going to get up and propose to make legal uh, an arguably dangerous activity that's currently illegal. That's just not a, a political starter. So let's not, let's not rush to judgment on this. And let's keep our focus on alcohol, which is where most of the problem is. It would be crazy to let the problem of other psychoactives distract us from the thing that's actually killing lots of people uh, and not just on the highway. Um, I, I, I want to resist the formula which you heard several times this morning, um, alcohol and drugs or drugs and alcohol. It should always be alcohol and other drugs and in that order. Um, so I want to, as I said at the beginning, and this is not at all false modesty, I don't really do highway safety stuff. I'm, I'm drug policy and crime. Um, yes, I was actually not, did not design the Washington system. The Washington system was designed by the political consultants who wrote the initiative. Um, and my firm was brought in as an advisor to the regulatory body. Um, so when we started that task, I assumed that, well, cannabis is an intoxicant. Driving intoxicated is dangerous. We, therefore, we have to have some law about driving under the influence of cannabis, and it ought to look pretty much like our existing law about driving under intoxicants. Um, so I didn't start out where I'm about to end up. Uh, I want to propose three principles here, uh, and they're pretty much the, the three principles uh, uh, Michael Woodhouse uh, offered us this morning. I, I must say, as was, was an American, I was incredibly jealous. Um, of a country where politicians are allowed to talk like that. Um, we ought to have a an impaired, dri said impaired driving laws that are consistent with public safety rather than culture war, um, that are administrable, um, and that are just. So public safety, administrability, and justice. And again, I'm not trying to cook a conclusion into the criteria. I'm just saying those are three common sense things to worry about. Public safety, we've already heard numbers about relative risk. Um, uh, in the U.S., for reasons I'm not clear on, we moved the decimal point four places 
Um, so we don't require, re re refer to a level of 50. We re re refer to 0.05 percent BAC. So I'm going to I'm going to use the American units. If you just multiply by a thousand, you'll get the right number. Um, relative risk uh, of a fatal crash with alcohol uh, at 0.15. Uh, which is mm, oh, eight drinks drunk, um, ten drinks drunk, uh, 30 to 50, right? So 50 times as risky, 30 to 50 times as risky as that same person sober. Uh, at 0 0.10, uh, about um, 15. At 0 0.08, about six. Uh, that's the legal driving limit in the U.S., the relative risk of a fatal crash if you're driving, using your cell phone with a hands-free mount, legal in every state in the US, relative risk of a fatal crash is about four. Relative risk at 0.05 BAC is about three. I, I say all this under correction from people who study this more closely than I have, but that looks to be about the number. Relative risk and, and now I'm going to use a technical term from cannabis research. Relative risk stoned out of your gourd, about two. Um, that's about the relative risk of a bad night's sleep or a bad day at work um, or worrying about your financial situation um, or having a noisy kid in the back of the car. Actually, it's probably, probably more dangerous than having a noisy kid in the back of the car. Um, sorry, less dangerous than having noise you get in the, in the back of the car. Um, the notion that we are going to criminalize that strikes me as bizarre. Um, now, according to most of the research I saw, but not what we just heard, um, there's more than additive risk when you combine substances, in particular alcohol and something else. But we just saw um, from Pyre uh, a dose effect curve for alcohol that's unaffected by the presence of other drugs. Um, so my, my later recommendation has to be given with a big asterisk based on that, that fact. My suspicion is that a lot of the risk of alcohol comes not from impairment in the technical sense, not from reduced reaction time and inattention and executive function, all the stuff you can, can measure in the lab easily, but instead from aggression, which in many people is unleashed by alcohol. Um, or perhaps we just should just say fearlessness, recklessness. A um, little bit of evidence for that study just done by some of my colleagues at UCLA. Um, Take all the drunk drivers arrested in Los Angeles County in the year 2008 and ask how many of them had prior convictions for violent crimes at the time of their arrest. And the answer is about 5%. Um, run those same people forward. Look at all of those people who in the future injured somebody while driving under the influence. Of the injuries caused by that whole cohort of drunk drivers in 2008, 22% were caused by the 5% with violent priors. Right? So this vindicates my teacher Mark Moore's mean drunk theory of auto fatalities, that a lot of this is not people being careless. It's people who are carrying out their barroom brawler instincts on the highway. It's aggravated assault with a 3,000 pound weapon. Um, so when we're looking at drugs that do not characteristically unleash aggression and create fearlessness, we might expect that the same level of measured impairment in the ability to touch your nose um, doesn't lead to the same level of actual risk. All right, now to administrability, and that's partly related to the scientific basis. Right? Can we tell whether somebody's impaired? Again, I think alcohol has lulled us into a false sense of complacency about how easy that problem is. Breath alcohol is blood alcohol. Blood alcohol is brain alcohol. Brain alcohol is impairment. That's a pretty, pretty close 
set of correlations. And the test is cheap, simple, quick, doesn't require specialist training, can be administered at the roadside, is not invasive. None of that is true for cannabis. Um, we don't have an established dose effect curve. The best numbers we can get, again, suggest relative risks that are lower than we penalize for alcohol. Because of the lipid solubility of the cannabinoids, um, there's latency in the system um, so that somebody can still be THC positive when he's no longer remotely impaired. And of course, there are two different molecules. Carboxy THC, which is what's in the plant, doesn't become psychoactive until it's decarboxylated by heat. That's the reason people have to smoke or bake their cannabis. If you just ate raw cannabis, a disgusting thought, nothing much would happen. It turns out the, the, the body reconverts the hydroxy THC, which is the psychoactive form, back to the inactive carboxy form. Many of the tests that are now being done by police measure total THC in blood, which means you've got no clue either about the reasons of use or about whether the person has any amount of psychoactive seal in his system. Um, so it seems to me that we're a long way from having an administrable uh, test for cannabis. And finally, justice. Because of the latency issue and because the presence of THC is not strongly correlated with impairment, um, somebody who is a frequent cannabis smoker has no way of knowing whether he or she is in violation of a per se cannabis standard when getting behind the wheel. And it seems to me a law that you can't know whether you're violating is per se an unjust law and should not exist. Um, we should also have sanctions that are proportionate to the risks. And it just doesn't seem to me we've got established risks for cannabis to justify anything like a criminal sanction as opposed, for example, to a traffic offense. Right? So the minister mentioned this morning that in New Zealand, there's going to be a level of alcohol impairment that's punishable the way speeding is punishable, not the way drunk driving is punishable. That seems to me right. right? Dr driving at 0.15 BAC, putting everybody on the highway at pretty significant risk, is and ought to be a criminal offense. Um, driving after a couple of drinks ought to be something people are discouraged from doing, but those aren't the same, the same thing. So, a prescription. Let's not rush to establish per se rules for cannabis. If it turns out that the cheek swab can be validated as a measure of recent cannabis use, and this is going to be complicated because is the cheek swab going to measure edibles, right? In the U.S., where we're legalizing either explicitly or implicitly under the medical rubric, um, there's a rising share of edibles. Well, if I eat a cannabis gummy bear or a cannabis brownie, is my cheek swab going to be positive for cannabinoids? Um, but assuming for the moment that we've got a cheek swab measure that will measure whether you've used in the last three or six hours, it seems to be perfectly reasonable to have a per se rule that says driving with a positive cheek swab is like speeding. It's a traffic ticket. You know, here's your fine. Here's your traffic school. Here's the points on your license. Here's your insurance sur surcharge. If the previous research that suggests that cannabinoids and alcohol are more than additively dangerous turns out to be true rather than what we just heard, and I think it's a question to leave open, then it seems to me it would be reasonable to have a separate rule that says, if your cheek swab is positive for cannabis and your BAC isn't zero, or if your BAC is above 0.01, then you're driving drunk. Right. One advantage of that rule, again, if it turns out that the combination really is dangerous, is that it's a rule that's very easy to obey. My BAC is zero n hours after n drinks. All I have to do is have a watch, 
and I can know that my BAC is zero. And you simply tell people if you're a cannabis user, you have to wait as many hours as you had drinks. That seems to me not at all an unjust law. But what I said at the beginning is what I want to end with. Let's not lose our focus on alcohol. What should we do about the carnage on the highways? We should raise alcohol taxes. In the US, tripling the federal alcohol tax, which would raise the price of a drink by about 20%, would reduce highway fatalities by about 6%. Doesn't require putting anybody in jail. Doesn't require any roadside testing. Doesn't require any public information campaign. Just raise the price of booze. People drink less. When they drink less, they die less. And of course, it's not merely that you'd reduce highway fatalities, you'd reduce violence, especially including domestic violence. Second, assuming that, th that our results from LA can be validated other places, let's start having special penalties for drunk drivers who have violent criminal histories because they seem to be at particular risk. We might want, I think we do want, to nationalize a program that's been spectacularly successful in South Dakota called Sobriety 24-7. Sobriety 24-7 is for repeat drunk drivers who in South Dakota are eligible for state prison time. We had a huge drunk driving problem in South Dakota. Um, high latitude, long winter nights with nothing to do, exactly the wrong ethnic mix. Um, so they had, they had twice the national uh, drunk driving fatality rate, even though cars are so scarce in South Dakota, it's statistically unlikely that any two of them would ever meet. Um, so what they instituted, first in a county and then statewide, is an option for people who don't want to go to prison after their second DUI, which is to show up at the sheriff's office twice a day, seven days a week, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., blow into a breathalyzer, pay a dollar for the privilege, with the promise that if your BAC is not zero, you'll go to jail that night. 99.6% of those scheduled tests are taken and passed, even though 47% of the drivers violate at least once. In one county, they actually reduced the penalty from a night in jail because they ran out of jail cells to an hour in a police holding cell. They get the same results all the other counties got, uh, Bo Kilmer has done, I think, methodologically very sophisticated work on this. You can see the paper in the papers in the American Journal of Public Health. Substantial reductions in driving fatalities countywide when these programs are put in place, and a 12% reduction in complaints of domestic violence, even though it's not a domestic violence program at all. When you can make mean drunks stop drinking, good things happen. We know how to do that. So if I had the, the White House bully pulpit, I would be demanding that states create sobriety 24-7 programs rather than chasing the will of the wisp of, per se, cannabis laws. And this goes back to something that we were told earlier this morning, which is that there are populations here of people who are occasional drug users who foolishly uh, use drink after getting intoxicated. Uh, and they may be able to be persuaded not to do that. Uh, I think it'll be much harder in the case of people who drink because deterrence programs don't work very well for people who are artificially fearless. My belief is that most of the persistent drunk drivers in the U.S. know perfectly well that they're not supposed to drink and drive when they're sober. It's only when they're drunk that they forget that they're not supposed to drink and drive. And for that group of people, the only thing you can do is keep them from getting drunk, which is what the Sobriety 24-7 program does. Um, it seems to me that the rest of the non-alcohol drug-impaired driving program looks to me a lot like the program of careless driving or sleepy driving or driving while using your hands-free cell phone it ought, ought to be addressed with public information campaigns and only very secondarily with the fearsome power of criminalization. 
So, officer, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you.